Side of city limits of Louisville, it's very similar to some of the challenges that we face, which was a study by J.W. Wilson and Associates uh, for the city of Carroll to Plano and Richardson. Uh, we did a study in April 2007 using uh, Buxton, uh, <coughs> several key locations. Uh, there's another one that the BD department did in January 2004, and so uh, those will be here, and you're more than welcome to pick those up and peruse them um, during the presentation or after the presentation. I think a lot of what's in there is going to be covered from public or another by Nika or the folks from Catalyst. So with that as an introduction, uh, I'll let Nika proceed. Thanks, Bob, for the introduction. I think you hit on a lot of points and kind of covered that. <laughs> the, uh, one of the things that we want to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page about where we are going with retail and, and the point that the mayor brought up last night as we were talking about our 2025 plan is that it's a changing environment. Uh, and, and, and we have changed. Louisville has changed a lot because 10, 15 years ago, we were the only game in town for retail with our neighboring cities. That has drastically changed. And that has really impacted our retail market and uh, what we have in town. So, uh, we wanted to give you a little history of where we've been, you know, the different types of retail, how do you attract retail, how do you do redevelopment for retail, and again, what Paul said, what we have been doing, we haven't been sitting on our hands for the past 10 years, knowing that the market is changing, we have been doing a lot of market studies and to see where we're going, it's just, uh, it's a slow process, and new development coming on, it, it makes it very difficult to, uh, to make that change happen as quickly as we want it to happen. <laughs> so we all know the importance of retail. It helps broaden the <coughs> tax revenue, it increases employment, it satisfies citizens' desire to shop at home and improve the community's ability to attract uh, other businesses and keep business here. Um, we know we get a uh, major share of our uh, general uh, fund revenue from sales tax, $18.8 million last year, very comparable to our property tax. So 31% uh, comes from our sales tax and 34% comes our property tax, uh, again, which is, which is almost a third of our general fund comes from, from retail sales tax. So it is extremely important and we realize that. You have different types of retail. You have freestanding retail like in Walmart, other restaurants, basically buildings that go within, within their uh, just individual buildings within an area. You have community retail, which is your uh, shopping centers, grocery type anchored shopping centers or something like Garden Park or Federal Plaza. You have power centers that have the large retail boxes and then several boxes in a row. That's the Target Center or Lakeshore Crossing. And then, of course, there are regional malls like History Mall. Now, again, I remember when, when I first came here, the regional mall was under construction. We were one of the 
the only city in the area at the time, suburb that had that large of a regional mall 25 years ago. And regional malls have a huge competition. Every city wants to get a regional mall. And so we are actually very lucky to have our regional mall, our happy storage mall in the, in the city. It's just that now after we, after the Bistridge Mall was developed, then we also have Stonewire Mall in Frisco several years ago that has created competition. Uh, then we had the, the, the Grapevine Mills Mall just down the street. So all of those dynamics have changed. Us. So what affects occupancy of these retail areas are primarily demographics in the trade area. Number one is the biggest issue is the demographics, the trade area, that determines the occupancy and what type of retail you're going to be getting in your various types of shopping centers. Traffic patterns, daytime and nighttime population, surrounding retail competition, and community growth, and expanding population base. So what I, what I talked about, some of the competition we have now that we didn't have before, so those are some of the realities that we have to deal with. Uh, these maps are, if you look at them, you know, they're very general, but it's extremely important to look at the dark shades on the map. This is area growth pattern from 1990 to 2000. And as you can see, growth is going towards the east. Look at, look at Frisco and, and what's the growth pattern. If that's the largest growth pattern in our area. We still had, of course, pretty healthy growth, growth between 1990 and 2000. Look at Flower Mount. Flower Mount is getting pretty, pretty healthy growth. Go down South Lake, up there, that area. Now, future growth pattern, this has changed now. This map has really changed as we are going towards the blue shades, we're not growing as fast, but those other areas are pretty much growing. So the population base is actually going to our east and uh, west of the Flower Mount, uh, Argonne, and then south to, to uh, South Lake. This is the population density because that also determines, density does determine the, the type and, and quality of retail that, you, that you're going to be getting. And then this is the household density that also is the determinant of, of uh, spending patterns. Now, average household income is, again, extremely important on top of that list, especially for what type of retail you're going to so looking at this map, you can see where the average household income is. You can see why South Lake is getting the South Lake Town Square. It's, it's primarily due to that average household income and how much retailers can draw, pull that money basically from, from, from those households. And this is the retail expenditure per, per household. And again, as you can see, the darker shades, the, the greener shades are in that Colleyville, South Lake, Flowermont, Bartonville, Double Oak, and then in our east side in our uh, Castle Hills area. So when you talked about earlier about demographics really driving the retail, basically it's, it's the financial demographics. It's, it's because, it's because it could be, well, but what I'm saying is the cultural demographic is you have a cultural group that their house, house expenses, expenditure for a household is 30000 you're going to have one group of shoppers. If you have a the same cultural group and their expen their expenditure per household is two hundred thousand, you're going to get a totally different set of retail for that same cultural group because the expenditure per household is much yeah. different. Right? Yeah. I also think it has to do with what they buy culturally. Um, it's exactly what I'm saying. But you can say if they've got two hundred thousand. They're going to shop at Nordstrom's. They're going to shop at the different stores where if they got 20000 they're going to say at the shop at the lesser expensive stores. I think it's the, I think the neighborhoods or the surrounding population, you know, determines what stores they want to go to, and that's what they buy at. That's why Hobby Lobby, you know, like moved to where their clientele lives, and that's what it is. You're missing a, a big deal on this, too. It's the age of the people that are living there. Uh, the older you get, the less you spend. And uh, at least on retail items. It's another demographic. Yeah, and, and, and if you look at the farmer's ranch, uh, same thing down there. The, the farmer's ranch is an older population with uh, a new demographic moving in. And so you, you hit, hit it both sides there. Uh, 
quite a lot of income, or at least uh, disposable money, but they don't spend much. Retirees. So I think not only income there, but also age. Also, if, if they are single, basically, you know, single people spending somewhere else because they spend more, for instance, on restaurants and, and eating out. So it's, it's a lot of different factors that I think Jason and John will be talking about. So what's a trade area? And that's basically all retailers look at. And again, Jason and John will be hitting on that. But it's a geographic boundary established by each retailer where they think that they expect to draw from their customers. So they don't go beyond that. If you know, you're know you living 100 miles away and you have a shopping center, they feel like people are not going to drive unless it's extremely, extremely special. But they don't have something in their area. It's pretty much a trade area. They say, you know. uh, and it can be defined by a distance or commute time or a distance range from of course, again, we talked about the demographic makeup of a region and the neighborhoods that staff to determine the type of set staff establishments that you have. So this is our major retail locations in Louisville, primarily Vistridge Mall and around Vistridge Mall on 3040 and on I-35 and our major street intersections such as Main Street and Goldstead. For instance, this as an example, this is the Garden Park trade area, which is 10 minutes drive time. And as you can see, primarily, it is Louisville, parts of Flower Mound, and, uh, and, and primarily mostly our city limit and parts of Flower Mound. And now this was developed before Flower Mound had their shopping centers. So now that probably Flower Mound has their own shopping centers on 24.99, this trade area has shrunk a little for Garden Park. Baylor Plaza, again, primarily our city limit, going a little down to Cop Hill. Uh, Jason and John have done some studies actually in, in that particular trade area on the south side, and it's still pretty much the same. Um, Mr. Ridge Mall trade area, of course, a little larger again, going more into Carrollton and, and Cop Hill area. But as you can see, their trade area doesn't expand beyond our city limit on the west side. It doesn't go into Flower Mound because those guys also go to, to, uh, to Grapevine Mills Mall, they go to South Lake Town Square, and of course now they go to Shops. In our Old Town trade area, now this is a little different. This is a trade area, but as we're trying to, we'll go through that, establishing a very unique area where people will drive farther to get to that area. Again, we talked about it last year, about establishing a sense of place where people just want to go, not to shop, just to go. So while they're there, then they're off the shop. So this is some place that we can create, although as you can see, the trade area is primarily our city boundary. But I think if we create that unique environment, then people from outside of the trade area will be coming to be part of that unique environment. So this is primarily, if we combine all of our trade areas, we can see that, you know, again, we're, we're, we're going a little east, a little you know, west towards Flower Mound and south to Um uh, We do have aging shopping centers. This is how Webster uh, describes or has uh, Retail Blight, which is something that encourages growth, whether it's hope and ambition or impedes progress or prosperity. And what affects retail blight is individual maintenance of retail properties, conditions which make consumers feel unsafe, traffic conditions, loss of major anchors that we have experienced in some of our shopping centers, overbuilding of the market. Actually, looking at the market, again, I want to refer to Jason and John, they will cover that. We are overbuilt actually in this area in general. We are overbuilt on the retail market in the Texas area. And we have challenges to redevelopment. Redevelopment is a lot more difficult than uh, green development, basically, when you have a vacant land and redevelopment. So uh, we're doing a shopping center, and we have experienced that firsthand. As, as many of you know, uh, the I don't know, we're not going to get into the more in detail, but primarily the, the owner of the shopping center is selling a shopping center. Whoever is buying it to redevelop is truly buying a vacant land. So the, the difference in, in price and making those numbers work becomes very difficult because it's not vacant land. You have a lot more cost in redevelopment. So full centers, a lot of a lot of owners of these shopping centers feel like full centers do not warrant additional investment because they're renting it. So they're, so they're getting their rent out of it. And they have, we have perceived extensive code requirements. Although, and, and, you know, Eric is here, if you can, you can uh, chime in or 
job. They, we do encourage a lot of redevelopment and talk to them about flexibilities. You know, if you redevelop, we'll give you flexibilities. Still, there is that perceived code requirements that they just don't want to touch, basically. Yeah, I think that perception <laughs> is not necessarily related to Lewisville. It's so, uh, Yeah, it's everywhere. It doesn't matter really where they're at. Most cities have codes that are as aggressive or more aggressive than ours. So anybody who is redeveloping in one of those cities would have uh, significant challenges related to bringing things up to modern day standards. So the issue is that they just don't like to do that. They'd rather sit on their, their hands and uh, be collecting rent if things are full. And then they feel like that aesthetic improvement is not going to bring them higher level of tenants. So they feel like they spent that money is not going to give them anything, uh, which I personally disagree. But, you know, but these guys, the experts will, will say. And trade areas are shifting from the existing centers. So as Claude said, we have done quite a few previous studies to, one, understand what's happening, and two, how to rein in the, the decline of our retail areas. Uh, so we've done a study in 2004, which focused on main streets, uh, issues associated with, with nearby residential areas, demographics, code enforcement, crime rate, those kinds of things, and describe the aging, aging centers and the need for aesthetic improvement, and focus on redevelopment of residential areas, because that's very important. Having new residential areas bring that new new uh, generation or that, uh, that new customer that, that then can impact the retailers that you have. Yeah, that actually, that part of the study was really getting at the issue of the local demographics uh, as people live somewhere in that trade area. So if you're trying to change the dem demographics of that trade area, you really have to change uh, whatever's going on in the residential areas surrounding it. So this was a little bit different in that it didn't focus exclusively on the, the, the retail business properties themselves, but also looked at uh, what you might do to change the demographics on the residential side. The couple models that we looked at were the Park Branch, uh, branch Crossing model, where they uh, had a fairly limited program that was focused on redevelopment of single family, and then the Fort Worth Urban Village model, which was uh, more aggressively focused on uh, multifamily. Which is, again, if you remember last year, we had talked about some of our older shopping centers um, that we could turn them into mixed-use development and add some residential actually right there within walking distance of the shopping center. So you're shrinking the like a little <coughs> plaza at 30 acres, adding more residential, but adding a higher quality detail to that mix of residential. Uh, so it, it, the, the study recommended specialized redevelopment ordinances and specific strategies for targeted areas and aggressive incentive programs uh, and the use of ED cell stamps that's uh, for a, uh, we, we've, never, we've never gone that route. And the outcome was basically zero interest from our commercial properties, but they had no interest in enhancing appearance, as, as we talked about in the previous slides, but they felt like it's not going to change their tenant mix. And we had occupancies in the 90% range, and they were happy with that. And we had no significant support for the EV sales tax to offset the market forces. We did Buxton Community ID in 2007. Buxton is an organization that basically comes in and does this huge market study of your consumer profile uh, based on their credit card spending. In, uh, and they have three vari variables, affluence, age, and children at home. And you know, where do those people spend their money? And then they match you. Uh, with the, so basically the purchasing habits for recreation, media, you know, everything else that they buy, the drive time, and then uh, they match you with retailers that they believe would be a good match for your community. And then they leave it up to us to go out there and, uh, and reach out to those retailers. And again, Jason and John will touch on that because sometimes that's almost like you try to contact them, you, you go out there and, and uh, send them information. It's like all of those so the marketing and recruitment. And we do we do a lot of that. I mean, we at ICSC, um, when I go, I meet with at least with 50 retailers and give them my information, our demographics, what we're looking at. But I think it's one of those things that it takes a lot more than we do several times to send them the information. It takes that somebody 
constantly out there marketing to bring this back in. The Buxton study <coughs> attempts to segment the market uh, further than just pure income. It comes a primary ingredient in that, but they tend to blend some of the socio as well as economic factors, uh, more from the standpoint not really of socio uh, demographics, but behavioral demographics, what types of people uh, are within the community, what, what are their goals and objectives, what types of things do they like to buy, what types of things do they prefer to shop for, how do they like to shop, things like that. So uh, it kind of uh, in blends the pure income demographics with some behavioral aspects as well. And then it attempts to identify recommended retailers for those areas. So the areas we looked at was 407 and Summit, Main Valley, Ecom 340 and McCarthy. Now 407 and Summit, uh, as you know, is still an undeveloped, major undeveloped vacant land. We still have a huge opportunity there that we really, really need to think about what we're going to develop in the future. So examples were at Main Valley, they recommended LinkedIn's Pulse Juniors, Cocos Bakery, Coastal Family, Champs, those, those are examples of what we Sporting Goods, Air Express, TJ Maxx, Ulta. Uh, and then we have made, our is that we did make, establish those contacts, but uh, also after the study was done, we got into that recession, and that kind of was a big impact on what the retailers were doing. They were developing it, they were expecting. So that Interestingly, on those locations, the vast majority of the, the quote, retailer recommended were restaurants. And then, of course, the Split Old Town Market Study, I, heard, I, I highly recommend the council has had a chance to take a look at it. It's an extremely detailed study, and it gives you a very good insight into what, what our market is, and uh, if you get a chance to take a look at it. Uh, and it's a detailed recommendation uh, for Old Town Redevelopment. Focuses on infrastructure. What do we need to do to attract the businesses? And, and actually, the city has taken a lot of those recommendations and we move forward. And I think that that is definitely going to contribute to the success of Old Town. Uh, so their recommendation was to purchase the lumberyard, funeral home, conversion to parking, so provide more parking, expansion of the plaza, meeting hall, or, or new facility that we're sitting in. So a lot of those recommendations were uh, were accomplished. And then they also said to focus on the residential market, bring more residents living to Old Town, enhance sidewalk pedestrian ways, and recommended over $6 million spending in Old Town. We did, as, as I said, uh, the city did uh, follow up with a lot of these recommendations, and I think a lot of good things have happened. And we have made multiple attempts to, to attract residential developers, uh, just FYI, we did it close. <laughs> And then, so what happens is the studies were done, we implemented, implemented the recommendations, we used data for proactive marketing and recruitment, we have made public investments to leverage private investment, we've created a, a transit-oriented development plan now, uh, two years ago, to entice new right type of development to Old Town, and we are in the process of finishing up the I-35 redevelopment plan to aid in redevelopment along I-35. So what can we do? We can change our cost, uh, consumer, which is you know basically bringing new consumers from other places or change what we are developing and potential change our consumers. Uh, we can enhance the marketing to the consumers, so proactively marketing Louisville uh, in the region and provide incentive to retail property owners to refresh existing properties. I think that's very important. We really need to deal with our aging retail and, and basically make that make them look more refreshed, so people would want to go there and shop versus all the new shiny shopping centers that we have in the neighboring cities. Uh, and then create a reason for property owners to raise the standard. Uh, we have, we are, and we have established adaptive reuse policies, we just need to strengthen them more, and uh, create demand for, for some residential densities, that especially in the old town. Uh, review ordinances to make sure that, that ease of redevelopment, that people don't have that notion that you know, the quote, they cannot redevelop their property and adopt a comprehensive 
Selector, site director, site VP for the Blockbuster, Starbucks, La Quintas, Valvelines, CC's Pizza of the world. Been doing this for over 25 years, so I'm a corporate real estate guy. My job was let's say I opened 50 stores in this geographic region, California to Florida, whatever. I'd have to assemble the team and do it. Jason would be a part of the team because I actually hired him 15 years ago when I was living out of state to be my local broker developer. Jason's background is development brokerage and development for CBS, Walgreens, and Target. So we bring that aspect, the two different aspects, and combine it for retail. And that's all we've done. So we're going to talk about the about us, current conditions, uh, the catalyst areas. Yeah, every city has some catalyst areas, consumer and retail trends. When Nico was talking about some of those slides, as a retailer and a developer, but retailers we have, which is data. We're just crunching data. It's very scientific now. And we can go off of that because what it is, it's trade area. The trade area is key. Uh, merchandising plan process, that's what we do. We get hired by private uh, side and uh, city side to do retail merchandising plans, you know, case studies, and next steps. So these are some of the cities that we've worked with. Uh, there's big cities, small cities. We're doing work for DFW Airport. And it works very, very well. Every, every place that we've touched, we brought immediate and long-term retail benefit. So this is just the smithering of this. And or, originally, this process, the merchandising plan process, was going to be kept in the private side. It got brought over to the public side via some um, larger planning firms, such as the Freeze and Nichols of the world. They would come in and then they would see that we were actually on the ground doing stuff so they bring us, they would incorporate us, and that's how we got brought to the, the, the public side. <clears throat> Pardon me, this, this shows it's kind of a busy slide. Some of the, the cities on the, the left-hand side, and when you go to a city, not everything's the same. Certain cities want certain things or need certain things. And so we have corridor analysis, uh, office, retail, hospital. Retail now is hospitality, it's medical, it's changing rapidly. And that's the fun thing about retail. It's always changing. And a good example of that is medical now. How the medical facility saw a bunch of vacant strip centers, and they moved in there. They took it over. It makes total sense because why go to a hospital if you need an MRI or some blood work when you have a strip center that offers easy access, good visibility, and you're in and out fast. So that's, that's an example of that. Current conditions. Okay. I, I think when you talk about retail, um, certainly for a lot of reasons, you have to look at the, the macro um, and 
communications. And certainly there's a global economy. Um, we, we pay a lot of attention to what's going on globally and, and you know, the crisis in Europe and specifically what's going on in Greece um, it has a, a big impact on the United States and, and our economy and, and consumer confidence. So um, just the whole purpose of this is just to get your kind of um, ideas going around, you know, the macro economy and some of the shocks that, that, that we can feel. Um, right now, um, you know, from a global standpoint, we're not anticipating a lot of growth, and, and that's true domestically. Um, so I, I really enjoy this slide. It says on the plus side, we've seen it seemed to hit bottom. Um, actually, I have a, a little bit more confidence in 2012 than, than some people, but if you look at uh, income, we, we had a lot of discussion earlier about income. We're about two thousand dollars off uh, per household on income. If if you want to look at that on retail, roughly each household spends about 26% on retail goods and services. So, um, you know, you take 2,000 and spread that across the U.S. economy. That, that's that's a, a lot of offset um, for the economy. Uh, that's had an impact on certainly foreclosures. Um, you know, fortunately, um, I guess it was this morning, unemployment was down to from eight and a half to now 8.3, which is exciting. But um, there's still about 22% of the workforce that has stopped looking for work. Um, or it's actually kind of out in that unemployment realm uh, being tracked. Um, one fifth of the population has had their you know, residential properties with negative equity. Um, you guys have watched your home values uh, shift. Uh, certainly that has a big impact on um, consumers and their spending propensity. And, uh, and this year, um, I think we'll see GDP roughly flat or the same as it was in the last quarter. So we're not anticipating uh, a lot of significant growth. Although retail specifically, um, in general, is still expanding at a very slow rate, we're seeing that store numbers increase, um, should increase probably somewhere around 20 to 30 percent this year, but the categories that are expanding are differently. So, you know, there's, there, the different brands are taking advantage of, uh, of some of the economies. Um, with unemployment, uh, there's a lot of vacancy correlation, so we spend a lot of time looking at vacancy more as a trend um, from a macro standpoint. Um, when you work in a community, you really have to look at um, the vacancy in a micro basis. So um, most of the projects that we work on, we actually look at vacancies at individual assets and try to identify, is this an economic issue, is it a positioning issue, um, you know, something, is it an aesthetic issue? So there's a, there's a lot of factors, um, you know, uh, positioning and whatnot to go into vacancy. Um, but if you look at vacancy overall in the economy, um, it, there's certainly a lot of trends, and, and, and it's certainly informative. Um, and then we'll get into uh, different vacancies. But you know, I know you know, I just circled this very small. Uh, fortunately, the malls obviously have, have, there hasn't been a lot of net new malls. Um, Highland Village is somewhat unique in, in this marketplace. It's got a very compact trade area, and we can talk about that. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of new growth in malls, so the mall tenants are have basically stabilized, and then you've had. Um, Concepts like North Park redevelop. Um, so our Texas economic conditions, and I, and I had another slide that was which uh, much more uh, ego uh, centric than this, but we, we've got a lot to brag about. Obviously, from a population increase, we've had a 20% increase in population, and we picked up almost half of all job growth. And so when you look at you know the impact of that on retail, that's uh, certainly uh, very specific and, and valuable. And we've got um, a lower unemployment rate, although. Our unemployment has been affected more by the influx of population that's coming here that have been unemployed. So uh, even though we're jobbing, we're, we're getting jobs, we're, we're also getting unemployed population. So um, that's, that's offsetting each other to some degree. Um, but we are seeing a uh, favorable sales tax increase. But the interesting thing is, is there's obviously with all, with all this growth, there's unintended consequences. Um, and I mentioned that we've also gained unemployment. Um, still one out of 1,000 homes, certainly not quite as significant as a national phenomenon um, have been foreclosed. And um, sad but true, we've got the highest percentage making the minimum wage. So although um, we're employing people, we're not paying them very well. And if you look at long-term statistics on even education, we rank 26th um, in the nation on, on education. So um, we still have some work to do. We've got some bragging rights, and certainly we're getting um, a lot of jobs and housing growth. But um, there are uh, you know, some micro issues that uh, Nika mentioned this earlier, and I think this is important, and, and this is really how we got in, into the space and are being utilized. The cities can, can certainly be more proactive 
um, in developing plans and in, in, in pursuing retail only because data has become more and more available, more and more accessible to the retailers, and retailers are learning how to utilize data, picking better locations, and, and leveraging off of that. So the more retailers use science and less art, um, then the more predictable you can be on, in essence, under, underwriting a market for an actual retailer. And I'll get into that process here in a bit. And just to let you know, as a retailer, we have at our fingertips, you can give us an intersection, an address, or whatever, and from that, from my keyboard, I can get the trade area, the population, whatever I want, and my fingertips, leakage reports. So retailers already have all this information. It's how we use it, and we'll get into that as well. Some of the, the bigger issues that we see, um, I think cities often lack what, what their true strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats. They, they look at other communities and peer communities and then try to compare themselves with peer communities. And in essence, um, we talk about demographics and, and, and you know, psychographics or socioeconomics. And um, every community is unique, although there are, there are some parallels and comparisons that you can make. Um, but really, truly understanding your drivers or your ingredients are available and, and, and using those in a way to help merchandise your market um, is much more important than trying to keep up with what's going on in South Lake or what's going on in the colony or you know, and so on and so forth. Um, but, but I would say that uh, in visiting with Nick, I think you guys are very proactive and, and, and have a pretty good pulse on, you know, how to leverage I-35 and, and the redevelopment and how to, you know, in, in the process of redeveloping Old Town and, and some of these areas. Um, I also think, and this is significant, we're seeing this, in, in, as Nika mentioned, in Roanoke and downtown Arlington and, and these places that have been neglected, uh, downtown Louisville. Um, I think you're seeing South Lake Town Centers and downtowns being redeveloped because people want to go to authentic places. And so I think that this redevelopment and, and the opportunity is certainly um, going to take place in either organic you know, areas such as Old Town or um, new developments that integrate or new urbanism and place making um, uh, opportunities. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be purely all new urbanists and all walkable, but um, I think building a strip center that's 16,000 square feet with, um, you know, double row of parks and, you know, uh, quite honestly very bland is neither appealing to most communities or the consumer. And so I think there's an opportunity to upgrade uh, some of the development, development standards and, and make a difference. And, and ultimately, I think through the aesthetics that we were talking about, it doesn't really matter. And you can say, yeah, I think it really does. Um, if you look at the shopping centers that have placementing components and you look at their return and their net operating incomes, um, they're certainly being rewarded for that. But as the cultural shifts, the, 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 the average shopping centers are going to continue to see, I think, additional risk of vacancy uh, going forward. And uh, I think this is very important. What you need in your city is probably a lot different than what you think you need. And um, so really just aligning those objectives and, and, and you know, are you pursuing the right brands? Are you incentivizing the right opportunities? And so. I think that's something that we could certainly talk and, and explore. Um, we were talking about uh, this earlier about you know really keeping up with the Joneses. And I think this is the, the biggest issue, um, and I'm not going to pick on Colony. I, I like the Colony folks, but um, giving away 40-year sales tax and 40-year property tax on, on a project, it, in my mind, that never pencils out is, is, is not smart. And I think there was probably more ego in that decision than, than a financial model. Um, we were, we're all about incentives and subsidies and grants, and you can see a lot of projects where, where that has worked, but I think we need to be very careful about um, not subsid uh, subsidizing opportunity, but really helping bridge the gap but with the right opportunities and with catalyst opportunities that certainly make sense and start to pencil out. So. And uh, I'll spend some more time referring to the development of the new furniture thing. Great project. I mean, phenomenal sales tax, but um, and, and I'm not going to underwrite, you know, that from this this perspective. But you know, you know I might have, if I was in their position, I might have given away the sales tax and property tax even on that user, but not on the entire development. And I know the call out guys, and we were involved in a lot of communities that were pursuing that. And I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for Dallas to work, but um, I think the, the city had an opportunity that gave up all the upside as well. Uh, so they're, they're not able to capture any any real benefit of that. So. Um, so let's 
get into the science of retail and, and how all this really works. Um, here's the four things that we spend a lot of time um, tracking. And, and I think retail can be very complicated, but we look at four things. What is the population? And we talked about demographics. You know, the housing density and their income has a lot to do with the quality of retail and the type of retail that you can track. If you've got enough people and enough income, you can uh, you, you, you have spending potential. Um, then you get into all the cultural shifts and issues and age and, and all those changes, and there's a lot of nuances. Um, visitor economy, and I know there's a slide that mentioned that. Visitor economy, like retail, are one of those things that you can actually pursue and change your geography and change your trade area. Um, it's hard to necessarily go proactively pursue uh, an industrial group or an office group that you you know, have no idea where they are if they're even interested in coming to the marketplace. And there's just thousands of them out there, but it's hard to be proactive. And then, then you get into, um, you, know, you know, jobs and peering and workforce. Um, but again, you can pursue those opportunities, but it's hard to be really proactive on workforce. But uh, visitor economy is something that you can you know, certainly um, be proactive on. Um, I don't know many cities that said, gosh, I wish we really had more traffic. You know, we just need to figure out how to get more traffic on our roadways. Um, but there is a relationship between traffic and retail potential. And so if you've got, you know, I you was know, here really early this morning and watching the you know, traffic patterns here in Old Town and watching all the cars come through um, the core of Maintown, and if there was the right operators that catered to that AM business, there would be an opportunity to pass or capture some of that passive traffic. You're not going to capture 100%, but you know, 3, 4, 5% might be realistic. And, uh, a lot of our work on the commuter population um, stemmed from some research, some primary research that we did at DFW Airport, where we actually measured the employees at DFW and the workers that worked around and the commuters that passed through the airport through primary research, and we were able to actually predict the amount of square foot of retail demand in commercial and office using traffic patterns um, and some of the other data. So very, very interesting things. And then permanent graphics, which is basically workforce, and, and then we kind of cheat among some other things in the permanent graphics, such as student and medical. Um, if you have a campus or if you have a hospital, um, there's patients and visitors, and, and, and those things are added to in, in your kind of your in your retail mix or your demand. And an example of this as well, a very simple one. When I was doing new stores for Starbucks, if I knew there's a high school nearby within a certain distance, I could bump my sales up by seventeen thousand dollars. That would allow me to be able to build a bigger store or pay more. But that plugs into firmographics. That's that's an example. And then the other, the other kind of ancillary ingredients are, um, we talked earlier about you know, political risk or policies, and, and we used to measure um, projects that we pursued based on margin, you know, how much money we're going to make from a developer's perspective. Um, we looked at assemblage risk, if it was multi-party track, if we had to assemble how difficult are the, are the property owners going to be able to really work with. Um, the other thing that we looked at is how difficult, you know, how crazy is the city going to be, you know, how long is this entitlement process going to take, and, you know, and so if we had all the you know the same margin and, and, and same you know kind of acquisition and, and, and economic risk uh, on two sides, but we had an opportunity to develop in a city that was very proactive and, and fairly transparent. We had another city we never you know we weren't really sure if we we're going to get out at the end of the tunnel. Um, then certainly you know that has a weight in kind of this overall criteria decision making process. Um, so let's get into uh, a little bit on the ingredients. Um, we've been tracking Panera. Uh, actually, we've got a great relationship with Panera. Um, go back six years ago, their average unit volume was around 1.6 million, um, which is a great number for an operator. Um, there's been some cultural shifts as, as these uh, fast casuals are becoming more and more popular for a number of reasons. You know, ticket prices, you don't have to tip a waiter, so um, it's kind of a trading down opportunity for some service level businesses. But Panera started realizing that their stores that they were opening, you know, some of them would be a million four, and they do horribly well, and some of them would do Two, you know, 2.3, 2.4 million dollars, and so they had a really wide swing on performance, and so there wasn't a lot of predictability, and so they started looking at the nuances of the location. Um, what are the other operators around them? Were was there a Target? Was there a Walmart? And was there both? What was the total square footage of other retail or other office or other businesses around them? What are the traffic patterns? And then they got into things like you know demographics. What is the income and raise? And some of the socioeconomic factors, such as also psychographics, which is what is the what is the cultural this you know um, composition of the marketplace. And as they started to learn more and more about it, they started realizing that certain ingredients that were available at certain concentrations, um, their store performance was generally better. And so they started developing 
a tighter and tighter market plan and picking locations that had these, these factors in great, greater concentration. And they kept looking at the model over and over as they did this. And so they were able to take their average unit volume from about a million six a few years ago to about 1.8 million within the last couple of years. They've been even able to refine their program even more. Uh, currently, uh, Panera's average unit volume is hovering around $2.1 million. So this can tell you that, you know, from a proactive standpoint, or the importance of data or the importance of science in choosing real estate locations is becoming more and more important. And this is an important fact because if you can understand the factors around a retailer, then you can start looking at the, the ingredients in a community and correlating, are the ingredients in my community looking a lot like the ingredients of, of, of Panera in a similar community? And so then you can start to, to see which operators might have kind of a similar probability of, of pursuing um, different communities. So this gets into, again, the different demand ingredients. So what does your workforce look like? You know, where are the inputs coming in from an area? What are the, what are the commuter? Um, uh, traffic patterns look like, or if you're at a mall or even an urban location, what does the what does the pedestrian traffic look like along some of these roadways? Um, and then what is the residential? This is where you're going to get most of your demand. And then we also look at uh, visitor economy. Um, downtown Arlington is a classic example. Um, there's a lot of factors that went in. They were involved in a big study, champion study that they worked on for a number of years. But with the additive of the, the additional visitor economy with the stadium. And the Rangers, they had this huge visitor economy. And then they had UTA, which is kind of another input of permographics. You had the student population. And then you've got a limited amount of workforce. They do have kind of an urban core, not much of one, but they have they have some daytime that's fairly consistent in there. Um, and then you've got this kind of homogeneous, fairly low to moderate income around there. I mean, so the ingredients to make Arlington work, just looking at it from a residential standpoint, if you're a national retailer, wasn't that exciting. So if you're building a market plan and looking at things from a national basis, downtown Arlington might not have popped up on your radar screen. But as you explore the other ingredients that are around and available and articulate those and put those together in, in a kind of a marketing campaign, um, the, the, the other areas that you can pull together start to offset some of the negatives on the residential population and the lack of high income or the lack of uh, a lot of density. So it's important to understand all the ingredients that are available around um, these individual retail areas. And you can look at this from a macro basis, but the drivers for Old Town are much different than the drivers on I-35 and around Vista Ridge Mall and some of these other areas. So you really have to look at location by location, what sort of capture rate you can get on these different drivers. Um, Jason? Yes. Uh, back up a little bit. Um, bread, for example. We used to have a Panera Bread at the mall. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah, it was, it was inside the mall. Yeah. yeah. What, what among these types of characteristics as they were evaluating their store sales and location decisions would have caused them to you shut that about? one down and go somewhere else? Did you yeah. talk to Terrence about that? Yeah, we um, we, we visited about Terrence. I, I know they had an interest in repositioning that store, finding a, a, a location. Um, no, it's not. No, no it, was a, it was a strategy they pursued, and it, it, it didn't execute very well. Um, you know, Louisville still has, the, you know, the opportunity. Um, and I guess this is a good, great. I'm glad you brought the question up because I'll give you a little bit more insight on to uh, Panera and this is how a lot of 